been given any. Baltazar, uh, as a judge, as a pioneer in the exercise of universal jurisdiction, your uh, actions concerning universal jurisdiction have established a, a before and after, I would say after the Nuremberg process, which was where a justice was made or with Victor's justice was made, a different time came after many years. And uh, Baltasar uh, uh, took up this claim from the victims of uh, uh, Latin American uh, tyranny. And uh, that uh, action, that uh, uh, personal position he adopted in defense of national and international law made it possible for the uh, progress of universal justice and set a milestone in universal justice. So uh, I don't think you need any further introduction, Baltazar. Why don't you tell us what Santiago Padres has done with the Guatemala case? We got that question from our audience, and I'm sure Baltazar is familiar with it. And we will link that to what Lucia was saying about making the exercise of universal justice more professional, more effective, and more democratic via decisions like the ruling of Judge Padres this morning, which actually Baltazar will tell us about as it was published in the news today. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the floor. Let me add a few comments to what's been said already on this discussion on this panel, uh, which, of course, will be mentioned once again and nuanced throughout these days. Before commenting on the judge's decision, I mean, Justice Pedrath's decision, and regarding what Zaria said about the Minister for Justice, and it's been clarified by different people who are familiar with this Lingo case, especially because there, there is this book written that I highly recommend you to read. And it is true. I don't know to what extent the use of, of uh, parliamentary immunity authorizes these people to lie on a systematic basis. I think this should not be the case because then you are uh, misleading people. There are different elements that uh, help us from from the defense or, or promotion of universal justice, but we might not share them. We might even oppose them in their arguments, but there's no need to lie. No, no, no need even to say that there was a law fraud or, or, or deception. Actually, in Argentina, it was not possible. And Silingo came to Spain to be on a TV show, but when the plane got to the airport, I was the judge, the investigating judge, and uh, there was an arrest warrant, and then we continued with the proceeding, the prosecution. That's the reality, because it was an insult to victims to allow this kind of repression repressor to come to a TV stage and then let him live. He had to be held accountable, and this was the case. But the problem with the Minister of Justice is the fact that he is not familiar, and I'm sorry to say that, but he is not familiar with the term uh, universal jurisdiction and the remedial effect of justice for victims or on victims. When these kind of proceedings are initiated, I mean proceedings such as in Tibet or Guatemala or Argentina, because it is the fact that you are initiating a legal action based on universal jurisdiction and also taking into account the impunity that takes, it, uh, takes place in those cases, in those places, in those countries where crimes were committed. This opening up, I think, 
determines the start of justice and remedy for justice. That way, you see your right coming true, the right to have justice look into your case. If what uh, the Ministry of Justice is saying were true, then judges wouldn't have much to do because the rate of impunity and the lack of decisions and sentences either here or elsewhere in the world would be very high. And I don't think that when you say that there is law deception, there's no need to claim that judges at the Supreme Court or at the criminal court are deceiving. Because in any case, they're all sentencing and they are issuing rulings somehow against that law. It is curious how this uh, is being unanimous, uh, but for some specific cases, and how they all agree that this new law is an attack, a serious attack on the rights of victims and how it has been read and interpreted by the legal systems is against the purpose of the law from March 14th, 2014. Obviously, this is the second ruling issued by Justice Pedraz. The one had to do with the COSA case, with an open investigation, actually. Maybe you don't know it, but this COSA's case is a tank bullet shot in Baghdad by North American soldiers against the Palestinian hotel, where the media and also some civilians were accommodated. I think it is a common fact. I, I think that uh, that all those uh, that were participating in, in war knew about this, and especially the U.S. knew about this, and Koza and, and other people died in the event. Justice Pedras uh, considers the preemptive enforcement by Spain, as it should be, of the Geneva Convention, which clearly sets out the enforcement of jurisdiction. So there cannot be even this little room for impunity, not even five minutes of impunity. So what's done in Spain, and, and I don't know if MPs from the Popular Party know about it, or maybe they don't. I don't know if they know what they've done. If they do, it is pretty serious, vastly serious. If they don't, it is even worse. But I'm worried, I'm concerned, because when I listen to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, when he's trying to interpret what justice or universal jurisdiction means or what international criminal law means when he refers to the po powers of the International Com Criminal Court or when he refers to universal jurisdiction, I think, he doesn't understand the concepts and it is pretty serious the way he has misinterpreted those concepts. If it is intentional, this is serious. If it is because of ignorance, it is even worse because it adds confusion, it adds controversy, because they are manipulating language. We, we all know, we all know that the statutes of the, Inter the International Criminal Court was enforced in July 2002, and that it was only then that a, it can be empowered to investigate and prosecute the crimes that are covered by the statutes as it's been said, as long as countries have ratified Rome's institutes. I think it is widely known by any, by any law student, and they all know that the principle of universal jurisdiction somehow it is there for all other cases that are not or might not be covered 
by such statute. It is also clearly known that this universal jurisdiction principle is a tool in the fight against impunity. And the purpose here is the full safety and protection of victims. So whenever they use this kind of arguments or ideas to justify an amendment, a law actually avoiding of the universal jurisdiction principle, they need to be held accountable. Politically, they need to explain it, assume it, and say, we do not believe in that. And so we get rid of it. And, of course, they be held accountable for consequences. Social, legal condemnation or international condemnation. Men mixing up different concepts, lie on a systematic basis. That's very serious, very, very serious. And I don't know to what extent, because we have an MP from a political party which is not set to modify such a paramount standard like this. And then can they say that they are working on behalf of their people when actually they are subtly and without a discussion in entering and forcing this kind of a reform, but when people uh, took the vote, they, they never thought this would be the case. So, uh, well, I have my own opinion, but still, we should be truthful, and truth can be built. And well, we are open to discussion. Journalists ask me for, did, did you invite the government? Well, I did. I did invite everyone. We are not more or less important than anybody else, but maybe it could have been a good idea to come in and somehow compare, match arguments. I, I don't want this to be some kind of indictment, indictment, sorry. But it is very serious if the fact is that they are not interested, and that's my concern, that they are not interested, since the government is not interested, and the public prosecution office during Asnar's uh, government, they are not interested in the principle of universal jurisdiction. Here we have with us some of the members of that legal adventure, lawyers such as John Garces, who put forward the indictment for the Pinochet's case, same as other members, such as Manuel Oye, for the Guatemala case, or Armudena Bernabeu, or Carlos Lepoy, Sao Dubremont, for the Argentinian case. They, they, all of them, can give their opinion whether the prosecution office try and do anything in favor of universal jurisdiction back then. Well, actually, they, they opposed it. They fought it. And now, back with the Popular Party in power, we see how the general attorney and from their downstream, they are doing just the same. They do not believe in universal jurisdiction. And here we witness a bottom-up rebellion in some cases. It is clear that with judges is a bit more general. For general attorneys, attorneys, we see a little bit of that, of that, but they cannot speak up because then there is retaliation, which leads to a different discussion, of course. But when the powers were as, um, allocated to the criminal court for the Argentinian and Chilean cases, the decision at the criminal room was unanimous in favor of universal jurisdiction. When there was a ruling against the principle in room number two, there was only one one different there was only one vote difference, so they were quite balanced. When the constitutional court fought for the principle of uh, universal jurisdiction, Guatemala 2005, the ruling, if I'm not mistaken, was also unanimous or mainly majority-based. Now, when there is a decision to 
interpret law for drug dealing. The ruling, the sentence has been 14 to 3, or well, overwhelming majority. Where we see that they are out there in that corridor of impunity, as Dolores called it. So, we see some kind of clear despise in, in regard of uh, universal jurisdiction. So some people, some decision makers oppose it, but they do not explain why. And so our citizenship, uh, the legal community as a whole, wonder, they all wonder, why is that? What's going on here? So this is the case, but we all know. There is an immediate effect. Well, it is Tibet, it is China, and some arrest uh, warrants against Jiang Shimin and others. But they are not shy when they say that financial issues are sacred, and the same we don't have money for universal jurisdiction, there is no money for historical memory. But we do have other interests that we pursue. But the true reason is not explained. Boko Haram's case. I guess all of us gathering here, we've heard about that terrorist organization in Nigeria that has kidnapped or abducted some 200 girls. Apart from other legal considerations, the enforcement of the law that was enacted in Spain back in March prevents, at least on paper, us from looking into or prosecuting and uh, pursuing that crime in Spain. The head of the terrorist organization plays all those girls on a boat and and sails through the ocean, comes uh, into the Mediterranean. We see it from one side of the sea, and there's nothing we can do. And still, it is a novelty that they have fight against uh, corruption as part of a universal crime. But if you read in detail the article in place, they refer to corruption amongst private individuals or public entities, and they specify as long as it is located in Spain, headquartered in Spain, or has a branch in Spain. Thank you for giving us the clue. So we know what to do to keep giving away to corruption and not being prosecuted in Spain. So, not headquartered in Spain, a simple start. Do not give me a branch. I'm not opening a branch up here. So we all know for a corruption to happen, you need to be headquartered in Spain, right? I think they're kidding us. They're joking. But this also, these are cases. We've got 43 people accused of a drug, drug dealing and they've been released. But somebody said it before, well, well, we all know who are alleged perpetrators of drug dealing, but they are low level, right? Yes, sir. But, they would, but also the, the chiefs and, and, and the kappas would be rele released in order to go and have a vacation in, in Mavea. This could not be it. We cannot be the guardians of the world. We cannot get a badge here when here everything's done the other way around. In the case of terrorism, in the case of drug dealing, things are not being done the way they should. It makes no sense at all, and it is very serious. Then, on the other, side, on the other hand, universal jurisdiction, when we've tried to enforce it, there's always been a discussion in place which I found uh, void of content. Sovereignty, national uh, sovereignty and territoriality were uh, prevailing over universal jurisdiction. I understand that once 
taken upon by each country is not an alien principle and cannot be once it's been ratified or included into different conventions, international conventions, I mean, which, by the way, Spain has ratified. So it is our right, sorry, our law. It is part of our enforcement of national sovereignty or international sovereignty that Lola referred to. So it is our right to do so. We are entitled to that by law. As in any other country where it is adopted, but it's an integration-based principle. Those are international crimes. Those are transnational crimes that affect different states. We are talking about universal victims, universal in their nature. So it makes sense that this is not something alien to countries, foreign to countries. This is the achievement of the international community. It is also true that I do not have, and you can see, I do not have with me certainty that what I say is right. But what I try is to interpret, try and understand how these principles evolved, how we've all contributed, we all legal operators from the academic field, from policy making to development of this principle. It was out there. It had not been developed before, but there, it, it came a time in history, and that it is back in the 90s, where it becomes more prevalent, more important or significant. And somehow, those that uh, have taken part, to some extent, we've helped shape the principle itself. And I could mention three, four, five men benchmarks, and you will identify it. Back in 96, the waivers and claims in Argentina are accepted over Pinochet. Well, they were accepted in, in, in Spain, uh, court number six, and my court as well. And I was enforcing the pure universal jurisdiction principle. But it is true that in the media, in order to make it understood, it is said because there are Spanish victims in Chile or Argentina. But it was far from, from the truth. If, if, if you read the rulings, that's not the argument. The universal jurisdiction was unlimited according to our law and code. Let's move on. By the time the International Justice Court, with the Gerardo Nguvasi's case in 2002, issues a sentence. This was Congo and Belgium because of the enforcement of the universal jurisdiction principle. They added some nuances and limited the, the topic immunity. Well, what's another step forward? When the Constitutional Tribunal in Spain made a decision that I mentioned before, another step forward, that is. When in 2003 we opened the way under Kirchner's government in Argentina to the annulment and overriding, so overriding an annulment in 2007 by the Supreme Court in Argentina, one of the components and final Participants is here with us, Justice Raúl Zafarón, an example of expertise, legal expertise, nationally and internationally. When he pushed the decision forward, well, this is just another example of, uh, of all the proofs uh, that the victims have recovered throughout a dictatorship. And I think it is worth mentioning that in the field of universal jurisdiction has been paramount to our success. Stella Carlotto, who is the head of the Grandmothers Association in Argentina, is here with us as well. And of course you can read the agenda because you all have the agenda, but still, I think it is important to recall here how we've all added content to the jurisdiction principle, to the universal jurisdiction Principle. So it is so unfair that a single political party, without discussion, without approval, 
they cannot come and take us. Something that is heritage, something that it, that it's an asset for all of us in the world and in Spain. And I am highlighting this because it is true. And I mentioned the reform of 2009, and it was very critical, highly critical of such reform. But the truth is that the ombudsman back then, in uh, January 2010, when they thought of uh, appealing or lodging an appeal, his, the ombudsman said, I'm not lodging an appeal because constitutionally there could be a positive interpretation according to theory for Mala and Faludu cases. And this was for some, some cases. For example, some, some cases had to be closed or terminated, probably the interpretation by the Public Prosecution Office was a bit not too thorough, but still, we all contributed. Gishana Spray's cases will be mentioned here, Tat's uh, dictatorcy. Human Rights Watch, represent, Watch is a representative, promoted this prosecution. This uh, dictator is known as the African Pinochet. The Court of Justice in 2012 sets out the obligation for uh, the fact that Senegal needs to try the dictator and it's going to happen this year. And why is that? Because in the preamble of the law for the uh, law reform, rather, there is a statement that I could read out, but in any case, it says that the reform is taking place according to the international conventions that Spain's part to. No, that's a lie. No treaty has been abided by here. Venice Convention from 88 has not been not taken into place. Treaty against corruption, treaty against uh, enforced disappearances, uh, treaties against torture, not even the Convention on the fight against genocide has been taken into account. So we've broken all those conventions. The idea is then, and I'm finishing here, why is that? Why? What's the underlying reason why, regardless whether you like or you dislike this principle, why is it that you desire to get rid of it? Why is it that you desire to leave people unprotected? And as Anna said, to set a number of victim classes or categories that it's despicable. Why do we have first class victims, those that are victims of a given type of terrorism, some that are fully protected and some some that are not. What about Tibet here? Well, they said, if you got your nationality afterwards, then you are lower class. You, you're kind of a Spaniard, but, but uh, not for this, because you were not a Spaniard when it, it had, uh, when the genocide had place. So it clearly despises all the values that Spanish citizens have built on. And not just Spain, but Europe and the rest of the world as well. We've all contributed. Luckily, the principle of universal jurisdiction is not uh, exclusive to Spain. I'm enthusiastic because, uh, well, uh, I come from Spain, but Luciano uh, mentioned it as well. What's good here is that there are countries here that are going the other way around compared to us. France, although the limit was a bit more reduced, they tend to, to prosecution and they even have a, a specific prosecution office for this. And actually, what about the lack of protection in, French, in, uh, in France that might be suffering this? What, what about Spain? Why are they saying no now when they used to say yes to this? I mean, it was mentioned by Anna. The lack of protection for our people who are working outside for humanitarian aid or cooperation development, service development cooperation, soldiers, journalists, I think it is even more significant here. What will happen then? Well, if any of these things happens, well, just a minute. 
I'm about to finish. If any of these things happens, then that's when we will claim, oh, law needs to be reformed. And this is what should not be. What about Holland? Just the same, Argentina. Just today, just, just today, Justice de Cuvria came to Spain. And she's working with the statements in Bilbao, Andalusia, and then uh, she'll come here for Franco's, uh, Franco's the, the, the crimes committed during Franco's uh, dictatorship. And so, a sensitive people, and regardless our ideology, because it's not about ideology anymore, but what about us, what about victims? What's the case law in Spain? What's uh, Spanish justice doing? Because they are not doing that. Well, in Argentina, when we were investigating, we were not allowed to go there. Funny now, funny thing now, justice, Argentinian justice or judge comes here, not as part of judge cooperation, but just directly. And Yusin, um, consulate headquarters or diplomatic headquarters. So this is a good example of where we find ourselves, how far back we've gone when actually in Spain we had it. Not just the promotion of human rights for victims, but we actually had a wonderful diplomatic tool, and that is universal jurisdiction itself and its enforcement. We used to be respected in the past because of that. Uh, sorry, Fernando Andrés is giving me a call because he's about to, well, actually he's coming tomorrow. Uh, and we are not respected for that anymore. Thank you very much. This. As for, well, questions for Baltazar, we have several of them. And I would say the connection with the economic downturn, well, and what conditions can economic crimes be considered as crimes against humanity? What do you say about that, Baltazar? I feel tempted to read the principles we're debated debating for approval at the end of this Congress because precisely one of those principles refers precisely to uh, that new step we need to evolve towards. I would say everything that has happened and is still happening around the world as a consequence of the economic downturn and its devastating effects cannot be overlooked, at least uh, we don't think it should be. We uh, cannot uh, be passive bystanders to families that have been destroyed and uh, 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 an overall lack of accountability, precisely because that accountability has been not defined in the law. Uh, as well, not as clearly as it is defined when it comes to uh, commodity fraud or uh, for cases where natural resources are illegally exploited or when there is a direct link to other crimes against humanity. In some, the economic financial element has never been described or even considered Although countries like Argentina are recently beginning to include that dimension in the investigation of uh, dictatorship crimes against humanity, they're beginning to weigh in that element into their uh, legal claims, the uh, development of uh, financial and economic elements in the consolidation and their role in the consolidation of dictatorship as well as the damages caused to victims. And this is not even meant to uh, get a, 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 a refund or a, a, some sort of a remedy, financial remedy. It's uh, more focused towards uh, the description of that sort of crime 
Perhaps not as crimes against humanity, but at least, at the very least, as crimes to be considered as a cause for international prosecution under the principle of universal jurisdiction. Debate and discussion will come, but the principle of universal jurisdiction uh, is not necessarily related to the nature of the crimes committed. That's part of the debate we're holding, and it will certainly extend uh, during the next few years, because so far, neither society nor co nations have responded. The legal systems in different countries have not been able to respond to the devastating consequences of the crisis.